Hi, my name is Dobbin Chow. I'm the program director for the uh, University of Maryland Medical Center Midtown Campus Transitional Year Program. I uh, hope that's uh, what you intended to view, uh, and that was uh, th that was the link that you clicked on. If so, you're in the right place. Now, I'm going to give you an overview of the program. It will hopefully answer some of the questions that you might have. Uh, it's going to take a little bit of time. Uh, it might even take the better part of an hour and a half. Uh, I, I apologize for that in advance. Uh, so make sure you're sitting in a comfortable chair. Uh, you have your favorite uh, beverage uh, beside you. Uh, and um, uh, hopefully it's a, it, it'll give you some insight into our program. Um, and uh, you won't be uh, bored uh, uh, to death. Um, I'll try to make it uh, entertaining and uh, helpful uh, and insightful. So we'll go ahead and start. Um, the, the so we, we're located here in Baltimore. Um, we're at the confluence of these highways. Uh, we look like we're located downtown. Uh, I ninety five goes northeast up to Philadelphia. Um, Eighty three goes northwest up to Harrisburg, and uh, ninety five south goes to DC. It looks like we're at the confluence of these highways. It looks for all the world like we're located downtown, uh, uh, but we're not. Uh, we're located in um, this area called uh, Midtown, and uh, this is the Midtown uh, region. This is uh, uh, I-83, which goes off to the northwest, uh, up to Harrisburg. And uh, this is where the hospital is located. Uh, and uh, these blue dots are apartment buildings where residents have lived in the past. Uh, these are apartment buildings that are relatively uh, close to the hospital. Most of these residents will uh, walk to the hospital. However, uh, the hospital is close to two um, uh, two, uh, two, uh, two ways to access the hospital by public transportation. Uh, Baltimore has, a, has one subway line. Uh, it's called the Metro. It starts in the northeast suburb called Owings Mills. The terminal station in the east is at uh, right at Johns Hopkins uh, Hospital. We're located right one block away from the metro stop, uh, which is called State Center. Uh, there's a surface trolley called a light rail. It runs north-south. The northmost uh, uh, terminal station is in a suburb called uh, Hunt Valley. Uh, the terminal station in the south is uh, right in the airport. Uh, and we're one block away from the light rail stop. So people can access our hospital by public transportation or they can uh, live close by. If you do choose to live in the suburbs, um, and, and some residents do, uh, they can get um, a larger um, uh, apartment, uh, a larger sized apartment for the same amount of rent. Now, um, the downtown is dominated by this body of water called the Inner Harbor. And uh, the downtown area is about a mile and a half, a mile and a quarter from our hospital. Uh, in the downtown area, there's a lot of uh, um, attractions, uh, restaurants, clubs, um, other distractions from our resident studies. Now, this over here on the far left is the National Aquarium. Now, this area of Midtown is known for the arts. Uh, this is the Walters Art Gallery, which is about three and a half blocks uh, to the west. It's a wonderful art museum. Uh, this is the Meyerhoff Symphony Hall, which is located uh, one block uh, north of us. It's, it's a wonderful venue for music. The Baltimore Symphony Orchestra plays there. This is the inside of the Meyerhoff. Uh, each year, there's a large festival uh, in the summer. Uh, it takes up... Uh, a better part of uh, a better part of a week, uh, and uh, it it's it's crazy. They block off all the streets. Um, it's, um, uh, it's it's crowded and congested. It, it it's it's a it's it's supposedly the country's largest art fair. Now, uh, why they have to do it right in our backyard, I don't know. But 
it's it's uh, it's quite there's a lot that there, there's a lot that happens that weekend i told one of my friends that i was coming here to this hospital to work they said oh great i finally have parking for art fest uh Maryland Institute College for Art is a well-known and old. Uh, it, it's it's been around for quite a while. It's located right uh, north of us, where it literally is. Um, we're we're right just to the south of their campus. Uh, so the uh, and then the Lyric Performing Arts Center uh, is is uh, for uh, music and 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 also plays and uh, opera. Uh, so a, a lot of art-related uh, activities in this area. Um, there's a lot of uh, uh, restaurants in this area. It's along Charles Street. Uh, there's a lot of nice restaurants. Um, this over here on the corner in the in the in the in, in the right in the left uh, lower corner is the inside of Peabody Library, which is a pretty cool uh, library. It's uh, part of J Johns Hopkins School of Music. Uh, it looks like uh, something out of Harry Potter. Uh, now, um, over here on our right is uh, the uh, Washington Monument. The Washington, um, this, this is right on Charles Street. Charles Street runs north-south, and it divides the city in half. And, and so we're located just to the west of the Washington Monument. Um, I heard they built another Washington Monument uh, down in D.C. Could be wrong about that. Uh, but at any rate, uh, this, uh, this is the old... This one came first. This is the original one, um, and so this Charles Street is a, a street with a lot of um, uh, restaurants, and um, uh, it's a popular uh, uh, a street, and a lot of um, uh, of our residents enjoy uh, going there in the evening. But I try to interest and focus their attention on this venue, the School of Medicine Library. Uh, the School Mesa Library it uh, has a, a, a large collection of holdings. It's open late. It's not been an easy sell. Now um, let me uh, tell you a little bit about our our hospital, how it came to be, how it became part of University of Maryland. And to do that, it, it requires a, a walk back through history. So this is formerly formerly uh, Maryland General Hospital. Uh, the original MGH. I don't know if we were, we were the original MGH, but um, uh, we were. It, it was here since uh, nineteen, uh, since eighteen eighty one, and it has a proud legacy of serving this local community, and it's a diverse community. Uh, as I mentioned, there's um, um, uh, that there's a, a people associated with the arts who live in this area, uh, and they. Yeah, I live in a um, neighborhood called Bolton Hill, which is a nice, uh, popular area just north of us. Um, to it just just to the north of us also are a bunch of uh, state office buildings, and uh, and and those office workers will utilize our campus for the healthcare. They also also they'll utilize our cafeteria for lunch, which doesn't say much about their cafeteria. Um, there's uh, there's communities to the west. Uh, these are communities uh, um, that are um, underserved, uh, and uh, we are proud and honored to serve those communities and provide health care uh, to the citizens who, who live in that area. So um, very diverse uh, community. I, I will say also there's three uh, um, uh, schools uh, in this area, University, University of Maryland, Baltimore, uh, it is located, it has its campus uh, right uh, right next to us. And uh, so those students who utilize that campus will sometimes uh, come to our hospital. Uh, there's, um, as I mentioned, Maryland Institute of College for Art. And also University of Maryland Law School uh, has its campus uh, here. So um, during the school year, there's a lot of young students in the neighborhood and uh, they bring a certain amount of vitality, energy, um, to 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 the to the uh, neighborhood, you really feel it during the summertime when uh, schools are not in session, and um, it, it's a it has a little bit we're a little bit less um, activity, um, and 
so it, it, it definitely is uh, uh, makes a difference. Okay, so um, in the 1980s uh, was a difficult time for hospitals uh, all over this country. Why is that? Because in 1983, uh, Medicare changed the way that it was reimbursing hospitals. It changed to a DRG system, Diagnostic Related Group. Up until then, you rendered care to a patient, you sent the bill to Medicare for the services that you provided, Medicare paid the bill, and uh, the times were good for hospitals. Then uh, in the DRG area, you could pay for a diagnosis. So if you admitted a patient to the hospital with, with say, heart failure, and whether you kept the patient in the hospital for 10 days or whether you kept the patient in the hospital for two days, you only get one allotment of money. And so this is a radical change in reimbursement paradigm that all hospitals around the country struggled with. And of course, this hospital was no exception. At the same time, there was this, this uh, sociologic phenomenon uh, that people were leaving the inner city and they were moving out to the suburbs, mm -hmm. uh, a flight to the suburbs. And this occurred in all the cities along the East Coast, uh, Boston, Philadelphia, New York, uh, D.C., and, and here in uh, Baltimore, tremendous growth of uh, the suburban lifestyle. Uh, so there was a suburb in the north of Baltimore that didn't have a hospital. It was booming. And the board of directors said, hey, let's move out there. We could do really well. Uh, a growing population, great payer mix. Um, and, um, and so they bought a 10-acre uh, plot, plot of land. Uh, they drafted up architectural plans to build a new hospital. Uh, I've seen the plans. So they were so detailed. You could see where the light sockets were going to go in each of the rooms. And for all the world, they were going to move. But at the last minute, uh, the mayor came to the hospital. The governor came to the hospital. The um, the, 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 the senators uh, for our state came to the hospital. And they said, uh, please, um, what's going to happen to the patients who live in this area? And so the board of directors realized they have a deep commitment to these communities. Uh, they have a relationship with the patients. So they decided to stay. And uh, so the hospital uh, continued uh, to struggle along. And in the 1990s was yet another challenging decade for hospitals in this country. This is during the President Clinton's administration. President Clinton tried to pass a health care reform bill. It did not pass, uh, but uh, uh, but he uh, uh, set the stage uh, for the growth of uh, health maintenance organizations, HMOs. HMOs boomed in the 1990s. Um, and uh, so how, how did that work? Well, so HMOs would enroll tens of thousands of patients. And then they would go knock on the door of a hospital and they would say, Hey, um, if one of our one of our patients gets admitted to your hospital, this is how much we're going to pay. And the hospital will say, "Oh goodness, we we can't do business with those kinds of rates." And the HMO will say, "Okay, thank you very much. We'll go to the hospital down the road." So this was a very challenging time for hospitals because they've felt compelled to sign these adverse contracts. If they didn't sign these contracts, they'd be shut out uh, from uh, uh, patients who live in their uh, neighborhood. Um, so essentially, hospitals were competing with each other. Uh, this hospital competed with Mercy Hospital, which is uh, maybe about half a mile away uh, to the east, uh, to Boston Cure Hospital, which is about three miles to the west, or Sinai Hospital, which is four miles to the north. Uh, and uh, consequently, in the 1990s, uh, many hospitals uh, well, went in the red. Uh, hosp many hospitals closed. This is a very challenging time. How did hospitals respond? They merged and consolidated into systems. Uh, up in Boston, for example, uh, the Mass General merged with the Brigham. Now, up until then, people from those two hospitals, you wouldn't see them together in the same room. Now they're part of one big plan, uh, the partner's health system. Uh, same thing in uh, Philadelphia. Uh, it, at the beginning of that decade, there were about 20 independent hospitals, some large, some small. At the end of the decade, there were, I think, three hospital systems, the Penn system, the, the 
Temple Allegheny system, the Jefferson system, and then these systems had multiple uh, uh, hospitals. Now, um, how, so how does this work? If a, a, a HMO came to Penn and said, "Hey, we uh, these these are the pay, these are um, uh, these, these are the uh, payments that we're going to pay uh, for uh, uh, patients who get admitted to um, yeah, your hospital," and Penn said, "No, we don't accept that." And then if uh, the HMO um, doesn't negotiate with Penn, then all of their patients who live in West Philadelphia would not be able to go to their local hospital. Um, that's not going to work. So uh, the HMOs uh, then felt uh, that they were forced to negotiate with these hospital systems. And then these hospital systems were able to uh, have some leverage. The same thing happened in New York City. And it's still going on in New York City. I, you know, I can't keep it all straight. Uh, hospitals are are, are 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 merging and switching uh, ally, uh, alliances, and, and it's, it's hard. To, you need a you need a score sheet to figure out who's part of what system. Well, so the same thing happened here in Baltimore, and so this hospital became part of uh, University of Maryland system. Now, let me tell you about University of Maryland. So, uh, University of Maryland is owned by the state. And it was founded over uh, 225 years ago. And uh, back then, uh, the state said, we need a hospital to take care of, of the citizens, the state of Maryland, if they get sick. And so it created the uh, University of Maryland uh, Medical Center. It was located here in Baltimore. It's been that same location all these years. Uh, uh, however, um, the people in the state of Maryland have moved away from Baltimore. They've populated now uh, all the regions of the state. And so University of Maryland feels a need to reach out to all the different geographical areas of the state to be able to provide health care to the citizens of the state of Maryland. Um, it, the state also started a medical school because they needed doctors to take care of uh, patients and practice in these hospitals. Uh, so, uh, in, in the hosp hospital and medical school are located in downtown Baltimore, and uh, they've uh, they've they've been there at the same location all these years. Meanwhile, the University of Maryland system includes uh, a, a hospital. Uh, it's about uh, forty minutes north, up uh, I ninety five on the way to Philadelphia. It's called Upper Chesapeake Hospital. That's part of University of Maryland. Uh, there's a, in a suburb called Towson, just north of Baltimore. There's a large uh, multi-centered multi -centered hospital, St. Joseph's Hospital, that's part of the University of Maryland. Down by Baltimore Washington Airport, there's University of Maryland, Baltimore Washington Hospital, which is part of University of Maryland. Um, about, uh, I guess it's six years ago, seven years ago now, uh, they they built a brand new hospital. It's, it's in Prince George's County, just outside Washington, D.C., uh, called Capital Region uh, Hospital. Uh, if you go three hours due east from here, you'll fall in the ocean. But if you go two and a half hours due east, you, you'll, in, you'll be in this region called uh, Eastern Shore, and there's Shore Regional Hospital, which is part of University of Maryland. Uh, so um, altogether, there's, a, there's 13 hospitals in the system, and the mothership is the University of Maryland Medical Center, which is a tertiary referral center. It's a 900-bed hospital and it provides tertiary care, and all the other hospitals in the system will refer patients to the downtown medical center if they if patients require uh, uh, tertiary care. And and you're going to say, oh, well, that's that's nice. What do they want with this hospital? Small uh, uh, community hospital, less than one mile away from the mothership. Uh, what? Why would they want this hospital? Well, uh, as I mentioned, the downtown hospital wants to grow and expand, it's, but it's been located at the same location all these years. The downtown location, it's hard to grow because they're located downtown, um, but it still, it's still, it's th still tries to expand. For example, uh, shock trauma was uh, four beds in the ICU at University of Maryland, and then it became a hospital unto itself. Now, uh, University of Maryland had to purchase a city block uh, next to the hospital. Uh, they built this uh, this trauma center. Uh, it has its own uh, 
ORs, it has its own ICU, has its own auditorium on the first floor, has its own landing pad for the helicopter on the roof. And then it'll take the patient straight down off the roof right into the OR. So uh, it's, it's a wonderful facility, but it came at considerable uh, taxpayer cost. Same thing for the medical school. The medical school, uh, a bit, uh, they, they bought a large uh, city block just north of the medical school, knocked down all the buildings on that block, dug a huge hole in the ground, and then they built this 27-story uh, research building. Uh, I saw it going up, and it was really uh, quite a uh, really impressive um, uh, see that co construction and the growth of this thing um, uh, over about four years. Uh, $120 million. Well, the Department of Medicine at the downtown site, they don't have that kind of money. So when the state purchased this hospital, the downtown site began to offload clinical services to this site, and the downtown site can continue to grow and expand. Uh, so uh, the, the Center for Diabetes and Endocrinology, the endocrine clinic, moved up here to the site. Infectious diseases moved all its clinics up to the site. Pulmonary moved its clinics up to the site. Pulmonary moved its sleep lab up to the site. Uh, so uh, by offloading clinical services to this site, the downtown site can continue to grow and expand. Meanwhile, the presence of University of Maryland uh, faculty uh, and patients and services began at this site to grow and expand. And in 2015, the two sites formally merged into one medical center, one board of directors, one CEO, one institution, two campuses. Meanwhile, at this site, there's been tremendous growth. We now serve 130,000 patients annually. That's inpatient and outpatient. In 2010, they renovated the uh, OR suite, uh, and, and and they did that because they want to accommodate uh, the surgeons from the downtown site who want to do their elective surgeries at this site. Uh, the reason why they wanted to do that is because the downtown site the, the surgery suite is uh, it, it's busy, it's hard to get OR time. So the surgeons learned that they could get OR time here uh, readily. Uh, patients can in and out of here pretty uh, easily. Patients like coming here, uh, not, not as much congestion as in downtown. Uh, and so this became a, a preferred uh, site for, uh, for elective surgeries for the surgeons from downtown. Uh, the In fact, um, about, Seven years ago, they put in an, an, an eighth OR room uh, to accommodate the increased volume. It, it cost a million dollars to put in one OR room. Must be the music system. Uh, th so they renovated the uh, intensive care unit. The intensive care unit is staffed by pulmonary critical care faculty. Now, there's about 50 pulmonary critical care faculty uh, at the University of Maryland uh, School of Medicine. They identified a uh, handful of them who would be our pulmonary critical care faculty. And they uh, are they ro rotate uh, staffing our ICU for one week at a time. Uh, they uh, become uh, known to our residents. They serve on committees of the hospital. Uh, they uh, know the policies of the hospital. Uh, and uh, so this really worked out well uh, for those residents, uh, particularly the, uh, the uh, internal medicine residents who are are interested in pulmonary critical care uh, uh, for a future uh, career specialty. Uh, these faculty have helped them uh, with uh, gaining uh, uh, elective rotations at the downtown site and also getting them set up with uh, research projects at the downtown site with faculty there. Uh, the sleep lab is located uh, here on our campus. Uh, there's a pulmonary rehab unit here. Now, this is a 22-bed unit. Uh, these are patients who mostly are um, on ventilator support, and they need to go through a prolonged weaning process. These are pretty sick patients. A lot of them come here straight from the ICU at the downtown site, uh, and um, and uh, they, a lot of them are uh, have had uh, solid organ transplants. Um, see, now, residents don't rotate in this unit. It's a rehab unit, uh, and um, it, but uh, these are pretty sick patients, and when uh, they they decompensate, the patients get sent directly to our ICU. In 2018, uh, they renovated the 
psychiatry unit here. It's a 36 bed psychiatry unit. It's a state of the art unit. Um, people come from around the country to visit it and see how they set things up. Um, it's a, I, I took a tour of it and it's, it's fascinating uh, that uh, they've thought about all the ways that patients could potentially uh, harm themselves uh, and they've eliminated uh, those potential ways that people could uh, do harm to themselves. It's, uh, but it's, so it's an interesting uh, unit and we're uh, uh, proud of it. Then in 2021, we opened a brand new ambulatory tower. Uh, and I'll say more about that in a second. But uh, we're, 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 we've uh, gone through this process of transforming into one academic medical center with two campuses. Now, here's the downtown tower. Uh, it, let's see, the endocrine clinic's on the uh, eighth floor. GI's on the ninth floor. Cardiology is also on the ninth floor. ID's on the seventh floor. Nephrology is on the eighth floor. Ophthalmology is on the seventh floor. And GYN and primary care on the 10th floor, the top floor. The resident clinic is on the 10th floor. Um, now, um, they, 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 this was um, uh, very, it's a uh, state-of-the-art building. Uh, the focus is on uh, chronic disease management, meaning that if you have uh, diabetes, for example, you would see the endocrinologist in this building, but you would also see uh, perhaps nephrology if you have diabetic nephropathy, or you would see the ophthalmologist if you have diabetic retinopathy. Um, and so you, it, it could be a place where a patient could see all their specialists um, and that the specialists could communicate with each other, and it, it would be a seamless experience that the patients are not siloed based on the subspecialty of their doctors, but that they get their care in a comprehensive way. So, uh, so we're, I think we're, we're still in the process of redefining the University of Maryland Medical Center as a, a um, synergy of two uh, campuses. One of them is the 800-bed teaching hospital and the, a, a tertiary referral center. And the second is a 140-bed community teaching hospital uh, uh, purpose towards uh, managing the healthcare of the local community. Uh, now, I, here's a picture of Mohan Sutta in the lower right. Mohan Sutta is the, is the CEO of the entire 13 hospital system. Uh, and uh, he, he's a radiation oncologist by training, uh, a wonderful guy, very charismatic leader. And so uh, he stated uh, that uh, the, the vision is that the two campuses, although they, they seem to, pre, to be poised for two separate purposes, one is a tertiary referral center for all the citizens of the state of Maryland who need tertiary care. The second is a community hospital um, purpose to serve the needs of, the, of our of our local community, that uh, together the two uh, t the two campuses uh, can uh, provide uh, care uh, throughout the throughout the state and also locally. Okay, now the tr transitional year program. Let me, uh, our our program mission. Uh, we're um, our intent is to train skilled, compassionate, self motivated physicians in a supportive environment that nurtures. Uh, your professional and personal growth. And our interest is to train physicians from diverse backgrounds to become future advocates for their patients, to improve the quality of care in the systems, whatever system is that they practice, to embrace scientific inquiry and investigation, and to pursue a career characterized by professionalism and lifelong learning. The transitional year program will provide uh, uh, residents with a foundational clinical knowledge and experiences uh, to succeed and excel in the future specialty training program. Um, now, um, I'd like to say a word now about the program leadership to give you a sense of uh, what that looks like. Uh, Dr. Marciniak is, uh, is the associate program director. She's a pulmonary critical care uh, physician. Uh, she helps staff our pulmonary critical care um, uh, clinic as well as our ICU uh, she's one of those who rotates through our RIC one week at a time. Uh, so she uh, is uh, very helpful related to the inpatient uh, curriculum. Uh, Jeff uh, Gerbino, he's he's an associate program director. 
He's one of the preceptors in the resident clinic, and so he is responsible for the ambulatory curriculum. Uh, Dr. Malik is an endocrinologist. Uh, she is the DIO, designate, designated institutional official. All teaching hospitals have a DIO, and they have a relationship with the ACGME. So they, their interest is to make sure that the hospital uh, meets the institutional requirements of the ACGME. Um, now, I'd like to introduce you to the specialists uh, and, and to give you a sense of how they work, how they, uh, what is their relationship between the two campuses. So uh, Dr. Hawk is the director of cardiology. Uh, he's 100% based uh, here at this campus. His office is here in the, in the tower. He does consults in the hospital, and uh, you'll get to know him well. Uh, you'll, um, you can, uh, you can uh, email him uh, EKGs to look at. Uh, you, he's, um, he's very accessible and uh, gets to know the residents well. Uh, Avelino Vercellis is director of Palm Crit. Uh, he does one week uh, uh, a month uh, in, in the ICU as the attending, uh, but uh, he also spends a significant amount of time at the downtown campus because that's where his research lab is located. Uh, but he's on a lot of committees. The hospital, his clinic is located here. Uh, he told me that he and the shuttle bus driver uh, are best friends. So there's a shuttle bus uh, that goes back and forth between two campuses. It runs uh, every 15 minutes, uh, and it runs from like 6 o'clock in the morning until uh, 7 at night. Uh, and uh, so people can go back and forth uh, uh, readily um, without, uh, without any difficulty. Uh, Dr. Onder is the director of nephrology. Uh, she's 100% here at this campus. Uh, she Her office is in the tower. Uh, she um, is the, the nephrologists also uh, uh, have a schedule for uh, doing for managing the consult service one week at a time. And so she's one of about a handful of nephrologists who uh, staffs the consult service. She's very energetic and uh, loves to teach and you, you'll get to know her as well. Uh, Dr. Kaura is Director of Hematology Oncology. Now, Dr. Kaura did her residency here, did her Hemoc Fellowship downtown, and then when she finished fellowship, she uh, started a practice uh, here uh, at our campus. Uh, she's um, been here for about 20 years, a, a prominent member of the medical staff. Uh, she uh, does a cancer uh, a conference every month. Uh, she also operates a, a clinic uh, that... Uh, Senior residents uh, all rotate through uh, to learn additional HEMOC uh, uh, on an at, at a ambulatory setting. Uh, Ray Kim is the director of GI, uh, and uh, now he's he's uh, also director of the endoscopy suite here. Uh, Ray is not 100% here; he's about 60% uh, here. The other part of his time, he's at the downtown site. Uh, he's he's a um, interventional gastroenterologist, uh, whatever that is. And he, um, so he does interventional procedures at the downtown campus. Uh, ID is uh, led by Pat Ruscavage. Uh, Pat is, uh, he will, he helps staff the ID console service here, as well as the ID console service at the downtown campus. Um, he's, but his clinic is here. So Pat's here. Uh, probably two thirds of the time, uh, ID is a is a is is a big big um, enterprise uh, here at University of Maryland. University of Maryland is known for ID. They have the Institute for Human Virology, uh, which is a large research institute. Um, the um, the ID division uh, has over a, a quarter billion dollars in grant funding, uh, not just here in the U.S. but they also uh, operate uh, grants internationally. Um, and uh, the faculty are wonderful, very, uh, uh, really sharp, uh, but wonderful people. Uh, they, um, I really enjoy uh, uh, working with them and learning from them. Um, endocrinology is led by Dr. Munier, and uh, his office is uh, in the tower. Uh, he's uh, does uh, he sees patients there. He also does consults at the downtown site. Uh, they, you know all. All the endocrinologists have the clinic here. Uh, it, when the downtown site needs an endocrine consult, they'll call 
and then someone from here will go downtown to 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 see the patient. So we're the sort of the 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 home base for the endocrine uh, faculty. Um, rheumatology. Jamal McDashi is director of rheumatology. Uh, now he's here three days a week. The other two days a week, he's at the VA hospital. Um, the VA uh, hospital is also where the fellow rheumatology fellows have their practice. He supervises the fellows there. Uh, but um, there's three rheumatologists uh, here, and uh, it's a growing specialty here in Midtown. And now, geriatrics is 100% based at the VA. Uh, Jake Blumenthal is director of, uh, of, of uh, geriatrics. And uh, our third-year residents all rotate with uh, Jake on the geriatric <clears throat> service there. Uh, emergency medicine rotation is led by Dr. Afra Ali. Uh, so all interns do a month of emergency medicine. And so you all will rotate with Dr. Ali. She'll assign you to different shifts. She'll work with different uh, 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 in, uh, emergency medicine doctors. Um, and uh, there's also a set of lectures that you go to every Wednesday morning. It's a very well-organized rotation, and residents have liked it. A palliative care is directed by Carl Alexander, um, and um, it's um, it's a um, it's a busy service. She has a presence uh, also in the uh, uh, ICU. Now, um, I want to introduce you to some non-medicine uh, faculty. Uh, Steve Kavik is a general surgeon. Uh, he's the director of the general surgery residency downtown, <clears throat> but he does. Uh, he operates here at Midtown, and um, you say you might say, "Well, why does he do that?" Well, as I mentioned, it's very hard to get OR time uh, at downtown, so he does elective surgeries here at Midtown, and uh, we're glad to have him. Uh, all transitional year interns do a month of general surgery, and uh, you so uh, you'll get to see uh, and work with Dr. Kavik. He's a great teacher, um, and uh, and and. When you do uh, that rotation, th th there aren't um, other residents that you're fighting over in terms of the uh, the, the ORs. And you come in, in the morning, you look at the OR list, you see which procedures you want to scrub in on, and uh, and, and 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 you go for it. Our, our interest is that you scrub in with uh, a, a variety of, uh, of surgeons and and, and specialties. Uh, here's Mike Lilly. He's a He's actually the um, the chair of surgery here. Uh, he's a vascular surgeon, and uh, he is well known for trying to convert all of our uh, residents who are interested in radiology. He tries to convert them into vascular surgery, um, but he's, he he likes uh, working with and teaching our residents. And uh, again, he has he has vascular surgery fellows who work with him, but not residents, and so. Um, if you work with him, you get a lot of responsibility in the OR, and uh, it's a good good educational experience. Uh, Dr. Hebert is the director of ENT, and you can scrub in with her. Uh, Dr. Sarah Ula is the she's the program director of the ophthalmology uh, program here, and so the ophthalmology ORs are based uh, here, and so uh, folks can take advantage uh, of, of, of that. Uh, ben Opera is the director of urology, and uh, he he really likes working with residents. And uh, there's um, uh, and he he's he he has OR time, and you're welcome to scrub in with him. Now, there, there was a time when the general surgery rotation was based at the downtown uh, campus, and we would put you on the general surgery rotation. Uh, and um, frankly, uh, that was a busy rotation. Uh, you were um, you you were there with general surgery uh, uh, interns. Uh, there were general surgery uh, students on the clerkship as well as sub internship, and you were competing for all our time. And also there was uh, there was a you'd be part of the call. Um, and so uh, when our, our ORs here became uh, busy, uh, and, and we we said why don't we move our rotation up to this site. And so we did. And here, uh, there's no competition for uh, ORs. Uh, you get a, uh, a diversity of different types of surgeries being done here. Uh, and uh, so our residents have enjoyed the rotation, and there's no call. 
um, which I think the residents also uh, seem to enjoy. Um, now, Dr. Lane is Director of Radiology, and I mentioned this uh, because I know uh, some of you may be interested in radiology, and um, he's, uh, again, the radiology residents do not come up to this site. Uh, he's, um, uh, so the radiologists uh, from downtown site uh, cover this site in terms of um, reading um, films, CAT scans, MRIs, and interventional radiology. Um, okay, I don't know who these people are. I don't know how they snuck into this presentation. Uh, the call schedule. So there's three ward teams. Uh, two of the teams is one resident, two interns, and one of the team was uh, one resident, one intern. And there's one to two medical students on each team. There's a night flow team. Night flow team is one resident, one intern, one medical student. Uh, the teams sign out at four o'clock each day to the long call team. And the Teams rotate being on long call every three days. So here's a here's a schema of what this looks like. So here's uh, here's uh, two ward teams, purple and gold, and they each have one resident, two interns, and two students. Now the orange team has only one resident, one intern. Uh, the uh, the the teams uh, uh, accept admissions in a serial fashion, uh, but. Uh, there's a cap of 16 patients on the purple and gold teams and a cap of seven patients on the orange team. The reason for that is the orange team is the ICU uh, step-down unit. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, they call it the intermediate care unit. Uh, these patients are not quite sick enough for the ICU, but uh, a little bit too sick for the regular medical floor. Uh, so um, seven patients on the orange team. Now, um, the night float admits a total of uh, five patients uh, overnight. And then uh, in the morning, uh, they uh, were transferred uh, to the uh, day teams um, in, in, in the morning. Um, this, um, uh, and so um, you, if you're on the wards, uh, you might uh, pick up uh, an admission from uh, the night float uh, in, when you come in the morning and they sign out to you. Uh, so the ward teams uh, take turn being a long call throughout the month. They, they're a long call every three days. Now teams have either Saturday or Sunday off. Um, one floating TY resident each month uh, works on the wards of uh, Friday through Sunday and then uh, they, 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 they staff the, the war team. And then they have uh, Monday and Tuesday off. Um, th let's see, uh, Wednesday and Thursday, they go to a uh, ambulatory clinic, a, a continuity clinic. Um, so um, so this, is, this is a rotation. And this helps, their presence uh, helps the, uh, the, the teams get one day off a week. Uh, now the this year we converted to a schedule of thirteen full week long rotation blocks. So each block is exactly four weeks long, um, and this has been uh, uh, well received by our residents. So here's what the schedule looks like. Uh, it, there's three and a half blocks of general medicine wards, half block of night float, two blocks of ICU one block of emergency medicine, one block of general medicine, uh, general surgery, uh, two electives, uh, one block of this uh, ward of cross coverage, which I just mentioned, one block of vacation, and uh, one ambulatory block. So a total of 13 blocks. Uh, now, um, if th the th this program is also the 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 transitional year program for the people going into ophthalmology at the University of Maryland ophthalmology program. Now their um, schedule is slightly different because they are required to have three blocks of ophthalmology. Uh, so they have four blocks of general medicine wards, one block of emergency medicine, two blocks of ICU, uh, uh, half block of a ward uh, cross coverage, half block of night float, half block of primary care and um, half block of elective. So if you line up these two schedules side by side, I think, I hope that you'll agree, it's, they're fairly comparable. 
um, that um, that instead of ophthalmology, that the traditional transitional year uh, 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 residents uh, have uh, more elective time. They have a general surgery uh, block, uh, and they have a um, uh, they have an ambulatory block. Um, so it's a uh, that's that that's the trade off. Um, our our interest is that the two groups feel like they are one integrated transitional year group. That is, a, there isn't a sense of hey, these are the ophthalmology TY residents. This are the transitional uh, traditional transitional TY uh, residents. Uh, no, our interest is to have one integrated transitional year class. Uh, now, um, this is the schedule for the intro medicine categorical residents. So they have four blocks of general medicine wards, one block of night flow, two blocks of ICU, one block of endocrinology, one of emergency medicine, one is ambulatory block, two electives, and one vacation. Uh, I, I, I share this with you because I, I, I want to uh, make the point that um, all of the interns, whether they're your ophthalmology, TY, whether you're transi traditional, transitional year, or whether you're intro medicine intern, PGY1, that everyone, they're all part of one internship class. It's one integrated class. The schedules are such that the responsibilities, uh, uh, the work is balanced, um, that there isn't a sense that one group is uh, uh, has uh, different responsibilities or expectations than another. Um, and, uh, and so I, I want everyone to feel like they're all in the same boat and they're all uh, pulling with the same vigor uh, because that's how uh, the ship is going to go in the, a straight direction. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you have the experience where uh, if you're part of a team and uh, you feel like uh, you are um, uh, holding down your weight much more than uh, other members of the team, it doesn't feel uh, right. It doesn't. It, the, the the team doesn't go well. Uh, so um, our, our interest is, is is that everyone, uh, whether you're TY program, whether your in, internal medicine program, that you're you're one integrated internship class, and everybody's pulling with the same weight. You like that? Took me a while to get that. Um, so just to just to hammer home that point, uh, I I I had the um, I had the honor of being invited to a wedding of uh, one of our categorical residents when he graduated the residency. And uh, it's a lovely wedding. And, uh, he, see, and of course, he invited his, uh, his, his uh, the people in his uh, residency class. But there were just as many people that he had done internship with uh, who were transitional year uh, residents who also came to his wedding. That, that during the transitional year, uh, the interns all get pretty close uh, with each other. Uh, become good friends, and that you remain good friends uh, as uh, you go on and you do your uh, specialty training. Then they stay here, continue their internal medicine training, but they all remain friends, and that's really that was really nice to see. Uh, this is a ward schedule. This is the weekly ward schedule. Uh, so the day starts at seven in the morning. You guys sign out from night float. Uh, then from seven uh, thirty to nine thirty, you pre round on your patients. 9:30 to 12 is attending rounds with uh, with with your attending. Uh, that's a hospitalist. New conferences every day, and then sign outs are at four. Now uh, on Tuesday mornings at seven, there's a case conference. Um, this is uh, required for the medical students. The residents are encouraged to come if they're able to come. Uh, hopefully, it's um, a very uh, educational session. All right. This is the downtown Inner Harbor area. You can park your boat here and visit the sites. Now, uh, one question that I urge you to um, probe into uh, is uh, who are your residents going to be? I will. Um, I, I don't think it's a. Uh, uh, I don't think it's a. 
outlandish to say that the majority of what you're going to learn next year is going to be from residents rather than from uh, faculty. Uh, you're going to spend most of your time with the the residents who are supervising you. And uh, so you want to be sure these are the people that you f feel comfortable working with, learning from, uh, and f uh, them supporting you. Now, um, so our, 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 our residents, uh, one of the core values for our categorical internal medicine program is uh, teaching, that um, we emphasize uh, 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 teaching. At the end of their uh, internship, uh, we have a retreat in which we focus on uh, teaching skills and uh, management skills in terms of managing the war team. <clears throat> we also teach them about uh, how to supervise uh, and mentor uh, interns and students. And uh, we hope that no matter what they do in their future career, no matter what they go into, that teaching will be part of their uh, core values, part of their long-term career interests. Uh, that's one of our goals of our residency program. And uh, so we hope that that will be, um, be that, 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 that will uh, have an impact on the quality of your experience as a, tra as a tra transitional year intern, uh, that you'll be the, um, to be the recipient of their, uh, their interest in teaching. Uh, our conferences. So we, we have conferences every day, uh, and they're given by subspecialty faculty for the most part. Um, the so each subspecialty generally has one day a month. Uh, although I think pulmonary critical care has a couple of days a month. Um, emergency medicine has one day a month. Uh, each month we have an ambulatory presentation given by the residents who are rotating on ambulatory block that month. Uh, m m conference is twice a month, Grand Rounds is twice a month, Tumor Board uh, or um, a tumor or, or Cancer Conference is uh, once a month, and Journal Club is uh, once a month. Uh, so we have uh, uh, we have a traditional Journal Club where a resident will, will present a, a, um, a study or, or a trial. And then we have a virtual Journal Club, which is a, uh, a sort of online newsletter and that's published uh, four times a year. And we want uh, residents to submit uh, um, su submit uh, uh, reviews of journals and studies uh, for the Journal Club newsletter. Now, all TY residents are required uh, to do that. Uh, basically, you uh, pick a study or a trial, you review it, you, you summarize it, and then you submit it for publication in the newsletter. Um, uh, we, we, we require that because we feel it's a, we need, we want you to have the, the opportunity to engage in critical evaluation of, um, of, of clinical studies. Um, and so this is one way of doing that. Uh, this is a, this is a simula simulation lab at the downtown campus. Um, we have a simulation curriculum. Uh, it was going uh, uh, strong, and then uh, and then COVID uh, hit. It it, it uh, closed the simulation lab, and uh, we've uh, since uh, since uh, uh, coming out of COVID, we've opened up our own simulation lab uh, here. Now it's not uh, nearly as uh, well equipped as a downtown uh, simulation lab, but um, uh, but uh, we, we have one here. The simulation lab at the downtown campus, are, um, we, once a month, uh, we would uh, schedule a session. It would be led by one of the critical care uh, fellows, and they would teach uh, our uh, residents mostly about running codes and about uh, doing procedures. Uh, the simulation lab here at the, the Midtown campus is mostly for practicing uh, codes. Now, um, um, uh, so this this is the residents going going for the simulation lab downtown. <clears throat> uh, we have to, we have two um, large uh, ultrasound machines. Um, the 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 one in the uh, the the blue uh, 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 gar. Uh, he's that's not a that's not a 
ultrasound machine. Uh, but we have two uh, large ultrasound machines. This is one of them. It's located in the ICU. We have another one that's located in the emergency department. And then um, we have two smaller uh, machines uh, for the wards. And those are for our residents to use. Uh, now, um, our uh, pulmonary critical care uh, faculty and the pulmonary critical care fellows, uh, they enjoy uh, teaching our residents how to use the ultrasound uh, device in the ICU. Um, in the ED, uh, when you do ED rotation, you'll have a chance to uh, uh, learn about uh, point of care ultrasound. And then we have these two devices that are available on the wards that you can use. Um, I encourage you to, 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 to use them. Um, we uh, So uh, now, how did this come to be? I, I don't know anything about ultrasound. And, uh, the residents wanted to have an ultrasound uh, curriculum. Uh, we created the curriculum, uh, looked into buying the ultrasound devices. Uh, these things are not, are not cheap. Uh, each of these smaller devices that we bought, uh, they cost more than my car. I don't drive a fancy car, but they, they, were, they were pretty expensive. And uh, uh, we, we, had, we had difficulty during COVID to uh, organize uh, ultrasound tr training uh, sessions because you had to be in person. Uh, uh, now we do have some training sessions for our residents. And, and, and basically, though, the more that you use it and have it with you, uh, the, the more um, facile you'll be with it. And uh, we encourage our residents to, uh, to, to use it um, uh, on a regular basis. Uh, all right, well, we're not. We're not a fellow-dominated program. We do have a pulmonary critical care fellow who works in the ICU. He's very helpful. Uh, he or she is very helpful. Uh, they, um, they will help uh, residents with new admissions. They'll help them with procedures that need to be done. Uh, they help them with critically ill patients who are unstable. Um, so they're they're on the unit and they, and they uh, they their 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 presence is is, uh, is is very helpful. And at night um, they're not here at night, but at night we have uh, engaged a a uh, a critical care attending or a emergency medicine attending, and they are in house and they will help uh, residents with uh, codes uh, with procedures um, uh, and. Of course, the emergency medicine uh, faculty, uh, they they're, they're, they don't like to sit around and uh, waiting for codes, uh, procedures. So they like to take the ultrasound and teach the night float residents about ultrasound, teach the ICU residents work at night about ultrasound. So they're, they're a great resource. We're not a medical school in that we don't have to administer a medical school, which is a lot of work. But uh, we have a uh, we have medical students who rotate here. In fact, our, my, my purpose is to have every service have medical students so that for every rotation that you have a student with you to teach, to mentor. Uh, and, and I think as part of your educational process, that if you have a student to teach, that, that will make it an educational, a more of an educational experience for you. We don't have on-site research labs here, and there's no intent to bring uh, research labs to this site, especially since they built this uh, new research center at the downtown campus. Um, we don't do bypass surgery here. We don't do transplants here. Uh, if that's your interest, um, you're not going to get that exposure here, and this may not be the best fit for you. We don't have sub sub specialists in every field. What do I mean by that? So we have we have cardiologists here, but we don't have left atrium specialist, a heart failure specialist. We have gastroenterologists here, but we don't have pancreatologist, uh, hepatologist. Now, if you had an interest in those areas, uh, for example, you have interest in heart failure. Uh, there is a heart failure service at the downtown site. They have specialists in heart failure, and and, and their patients are generally in, uh, refractory patients with heart failure. Uh, they're on LVATs or they're on balloon pumps, and basically they're in line waiting for transplant. Same thing with hepatology. Uh, there's a hepatology service at the downtown site. There's hepatologists staffing that service, 
these patients are they, they have advanced cirrhosis and basically they're in line waiting for a transplant. Okay, what's unique about our campus? Well, our training programs, the internal medicine program and, and the transitional year program, they're they're valued and held in high importance by the institution. Uh, I meet with the CEO uh, every month, and the first question they ask is, uh, um, hey, how's the uh, program? How are the residents? Anything we can do to help? A uh, very supportive um, um, atmosphere, environment for resident training. Um, is, that's not universal around the country. Um, our My uh, perspective that I want this to be a resident-run program, it's a small program. Uh, you can make a difference here, and you should make a difference here. I want to feel like I'm I'm sitting at the back of the bus. I want the residents uh, moving us forward, uh, take uh, taking us in uh, the directions in which they have interest in pursuing. So, for example, I mentioned about the um, simulation curriculum. I don't know anything about simulation. That's uh, that's definitely uh, uh, out out of my uh, expertise, but. The residents pursued it. Uh, they created that curriculum. Uh, they implemented it. And uh, in fact, the director of the simulation lab at the downtown campus said that we utilized their lab more than the residency at the downtown campus utilized their lab. Uh, I don't know anything about point of care ultrasound. I wouldn't know which end of the probe to hold. Uh, but uh, the residents were interested in it. We uh, uh, pursued it. We developed the curriculum. We even found some money uh, to buy the uh, ultrasound devices. Uh, again, this is all born from the, the resident's interest. Um, so uh, so um, we, 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 we want you to, to, to put a stake in the ground. Uh, we want you to uh, see how the program uh, can be better, see how the institution can be better, and for you to be the agent of change. And uh, I think that's approach to be taken with you, uh, no matter what uh, institution you go to, uh, when you eventually go out uh, and finish your residency, no matter what organization you belong to, that you will want to make that organization better. You want to make that institution better. And so that approach should begin here during your uh, internship. Now, every program that you look at, you look at the balance between education and service. Um, we think that our residents are here for a educational experience, not here to be service workers for the hospital. Uh, you can go right now and take the residents out of the hospital. The hospital wouldn't close. Uh, we have critical care, uh, uh, home crit faculty. We have hospitalists. Uh, the care would go on. Um, the 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 um, yeah, our, 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 so uh, so so. Let me give you an example of how this. Uh, give you an example of this. Um, so uh, the cap on resident services, if there's one resident, two interns, the cap on that kind of service is twenty patients, and this cap is established by the ACGME. It's, it's not uh, here uh, at our hospital. It's it's a national cap. Okay, so we had that cap in place, but we were never really near. 20. We, the resident services were running 12, uh, uh, 13, 14, 15, uh, 16 on a busy day, something in that range. Never got to 20. Uh, but COVID hit. And during the pandemic, we were at 20 every day. It was crazy. And, uh, I, and so I thought to myself, oh, gosh, well, once we're out of the pandemic, we'll go back to uh, business as usual. No, that didn't happen. We were still um, at, at at twenty patients a day on these on these uh, teaching services. Now, why is that? So during COVID, the downtown campus became a COVID hospital. That's because they had uh, their focus is uh, uh, is uh, critical care. At the downtown campus, they have thirteen ICUs. Uh, they have a they have a neurocritical care. They have a surgical critical care. They have a shock trauma critical care. They have a NICU. Um, and so they're, they're, they're heavy in critical care. Uh, so what happened was that patients with COVID would, would prefer preferentially be housed 
at the downtown campus, and then non-COVID patients would be admitted uh, here. Uh, here we have uh, 18 beds in our ICU, and we have uh, three of these beds uh, on the floors with the reverse uh, ventilation, uh, negative pressure beds, I'm sorry. So um, I, I don't, um, so what's happened is that, um, uh, sorry, what's happened is that uh, we, um, if we stay, we're at 20, and the residents were able to manage the work that was required. Uh, they, uh, they, they, they got the patients seen, uh, but uh, the, the educational mission uh, was missed, that they weren't uh, able to extract an educational experience from each patient. So we reduced the cap from 20 down to 18. And so we did that for a few months. And uh, th and I checked with the residents, and they said, oh, well, um, it's better, but uh, we still are f it's, it was our focus every day is on getting the patients the service, service that they need, and we're not able to uh, focus on uh, learning uh, from each patient. And so then we reduced the cap to 16, and that's where it is now. And I think that's been that's been good. Uh, the it's, it gives the residents a broad exposure. Uh, Sixteen patients gives them a good exposure, uh, uh, but also gives them opportunity to study, learn, uh, and make each encounter an educational experience. Now you're going to say, "Well, that's nice. What about those patients uh, who are not able to be admitted to the resident service?" Uh, so we have two of those uh, two of those services. So that's eight patients that all of a sudden now cannot be admitted to the resident service. What's going to happen to them? So uh, we had to hire a hospitalist, and and we had to create a hospitalist non-teaching service to take on that extra volume. Now the way that hospitalists work is they work seven days on, and then they're off for seven days, and then when they're off, another hospitalist works for seven days, and they're off. So they rotate uh, uh, seven days on, seven days off. So you have to hire you have to hire two hospitalists. So in order to reduce the cap down from twenty down to uh, uh, sixteen, uh, that that cost us a quarter uh, uh, million dollars um, uh, each hospitalist. So that's uh, that's half a million dollars uh, to create this non-teaching service. So at the end of the day, half a million dollars is not something to sneeze at. Uh, so the hospital was so this is just an example of that the hospital hospital is willing to uh, ante up uh, in the interest of preserving the educational experience for our residents. Okay, sometimes I get the question, well, what are we looking for in a candidate? Well. Uh, we're looking for residents who have have demonstrated uh, initiative, intellectual curiosity, self-discipline, self-motivation, resourcefulness, drive, and uh, and and teamwork. So I, I know these are um, abstract uh, ideas. So let me give you let me give you an example. Um, uh, so we had a um, uh, we had a resident who uh, he. he uh, was doing um, uh, he was doing ICU uh, he liked critical care uh, he um, and and so he joined uh, the critical care committee uh, by the way every resident has to be a member of a committee I'll say more about that uh, in a minute but anyway he was a member of the critical care committee and during one of the meetings they passed out this handout and they said gee look at all the blood that we're transfusing in the ICU here month of September Month of February, we transfused these many units. March, we transfused these many units. Uh, April, we transfused these many units, and and everybody shook their head and said, "Gosh, uh, that's a lot of blood. Uh, uh, what what do we do about this?" And the intern said, "Hey, it's obvious why uh, we're transfusing uh, so much blood. Every day, we're taking out vials and vials of blood from our patients in the morning, and then the afternoon, and the evening." And then you wonder why they're anemic. And then he said, why don't we use pediatric tubes? 
And the members of the committee looked at each other and they said, hmm, what are pediatric tubes? We don't have pediatrics here at this uh, hospital. Uh, they've never seen pediatric tubes. And uh, so they said to this resident, hey, why don't you look into it? So he, he did. He went down to the lab. He checked. And the lab, is the machines are able to accommodate pediatric tubes. You had to flip, flip a button. Now, there were a lot of cobwebs on, that, on those buttons. Even the lab uh, techs weren't even aware of it. Um, so then uh, he looked into the price of pediatric tubes. And the price is approximately the same as the regular adult tubes. So he said, "Hey, let's let's do this. Let's let's go for it." Well, not so fast. Uh, he had to prove that the results that you get from pediatric tubes the same as the results in the adult tubes. So he had to do a study, and to do a study, you had to go through the um, institutional review board (IRB). So he had to submit a proposal to the IRB. He had to write a consent form. The patient had to, had a sign that allowed a a small amount of their blood to be put into a pediatric tube, whatever they're getting blood drawn. And uh, so that took that took several months because uh, as I'm sure you all, uh, if you've had the experience of going uh, through and writing up the AR, IR, IRB submission, getting it approved, it takes months. So at any rate, uh, he, he did it. He got the phlebotomist to agree uh, to help him and they would get the patients to sign the consent forms. And then... We got, we got data, and uh, we looked. He and I looked at the data, and we said, "Gee, this, this looks pretty good, very comparable." And and we said, "Okay, great." Well, not so fast. Uh, he had to go down to the uh, school of uh, public health and biostatistics and uh, found a biostatistician who helped him with a program that would uh, d d try to establish uh, whether the, these. Um, uh, these uh, th there was a strong correlation between uh, the two sets of data. Indeed, there was. Uh, so then we were ready to go, um, and then um, he graduated. <laughs> so uh, so we never and and then uh, and then the lab director retired. Uh, so the the project uh, has yet to get off the ground, um, but. Um, uh, that would be, uh, anyways. It's still, it's still in the, still on a back burner. But I think just, just an example of a a um, resident who uh, sh shows some initiative. Uh, he was resourceful. Um, he, and, and this is the kind of person that the hospital loves to support. They want them to uh, to, to to work uh, in ways to help improve the care of patients at our hospital. Uh, that project is not. Uh, we haven't uh, uh, sunset the project. It's still uh, sort of simmering on a back burner. Uh, if someone wants to pursue it, uh, we certainly would uh, look to do that. All right. So these are the requirements uh, you have, and these are not our requirements. These are requirements that are set by the ACGME for TY programs around the country. You have to have 120, 140 hours of continuity primary care. Uh, you. You have to do a be involved in a scholarly scholarly project. So we require everyone to present a poster at the uh, Maryland ACP annual meeting. It's basically a, a case a case report. Now, over the course of the year, you'll you'll encounter many interesting cases. You pick one. You take your history. You throw it on a poster. You take your uh, EKG. You throw it on the poster. Maybe there's an interesting image. You throw it on the poster. Next thing you know, you got a poster, and so you present the poster, and uh, it's it's a fun time. There's over 240 posters presented at this meeting from residency programs around the state. Um, it's a busy meeting; it's a lot of fun, uh, <clears throat> and uh, some of the residents they've been able to uh, take their uh, material from their poster, uh, transform it into a manuscript, submit the manuscript, and get it published. Uh, we everyone has to complete some online modules from the Institute of Healthcare Improvement on uh, quality improvement. Uh, these are very educational modules. I've done them myself. Uh, they have to participate in a QI project. All right, they have to participate in the project. They don't have to do a project. I think asking you to do a project is asking a lot. So uh, there's a lot of projects that are, that are ongoing. You can join them. 
all the senior residents are required to do a project. You can join one of their projects. Uh, the departments all have projects going on, radiology department, anesthesiology department. Um, uh, they, they, they all are trying to improve the quality of care. So you can join a project and, or you can uh, join a resident project. Uh, there's, uh, it, yeah, so the, it, I know that as you go on into your advanced program, they also are going to require you to, to, uh, to complete a uh, QI project. So this is a way to sort of get a, a, a taste, uh, get some experience with QI. You have to be on, on a committee. Uh, now, um, why do we do that? Um, hospitals run through, all hospitals in this country, they run through committees. And uh, there may be a, a dozen or more committees. And then these committees report to a, a uh, executive committee. And then decisions are made and recommendations are made. And that's how things change and evolve in a hospital. Uh, so um, if you're on, if you're assigned to a committee, uh, we they look for your input. Uh, they look, so for example, the critical care committee, they will look for input from residents who work in the critical care setting. Uh, there's a pharmacy and therapeutics committee. The pharmacists always looking for input from residents. Uh, the There's a, a code uh, committee uh, for codes. There's a rapid response committee. There's numerous uh, quality committees uh, on um, sepsis, on uh, uh, healthcare associated infections, um, central line associated infections. Uh, th so there's, there's, there's many committees. Uh, we, we want you to join one, contribute to it, and your contributions will be, will be very meaningful. I know it already because they look for, they look for residents. Uh, residents don't have an ax to grind. Uh, you don't have an agenda. Uh, you, you're in the trenches. You see how care is provided every day. And so they trust your judgment. They, tr they trust your insights. Uh, you're um, sort of the, you, you're basically the eyes um, of the committee in the trenches on, in the, in the location where care is being rendered. Now, as I mentioned, uh, you participate in the journal club. And again, uh, wh wh why would we do have you do this? Because the, the, the ACGM requirements re uh, are state that you need to uh, be able to analyze and evaluate the medical literature. Uh, you have to be involved in uh, uh, quality improvement. Uh, you have to be involved in scholarly activity. So these are ways to meet those requirements. And um, hopefully they're not uh, uh, very uh, uh, time-consuming or onerous. <clears throat> okay, uh, I'll go over uh, some of the, uh, where TY uh, folks have gone in the past. <clears throat> Uh, so here uh, in 2017, we had a boatload of people going on uh, to uh, to go on to uh, radiology. A couple for anesthesiology, one for radonc, uh, and one uh, did in internal medicine here. In two 2018, there was a boatload of ophthalmologists here, and um, and the rest were um, radiologists. Um, in 2019, it switched back to radiology. Now. You, you look at this, uh, there's one, two, three, four. Four of these people uh, went on to do radiology at University of Maryland in their radiology residency program. Uh, that was a lot of, that was pretty cool because uh, when here uh, we would, we would um, after they graduated, uh, we would see the, their the signature line after uh, a, a radiology or CAT scan uh, test was interpreted. And then we would say to each other, oh, we know him back when he was a uh, re uh, intern, or we know her back when she was an intern. And it was, uh, it was that, that was a lot of fun. These four, uh, they were quite, uh, they, they were characters. Uh, they were a lot of fun to work with. Um, when they graduated the radiology residency in, uh, this was last June, not this, the, the year past, uh, they called me up. And they said, uh, "Hey, Dr. Chow, let's. Uh, you got. You, you, we're graduating from residence. You got to take us out for a beer. <laughs> so, so we got together. Uh, it's, it's great to see them again. And 
Yeah, it, there were there was there were a lot of fun. Now, twenty twenty, uh, so we had a couple of people go into IR and and then. Uh, others go to uh, radiology, uh, diagnostic radiology, and two into ophthalmology. And then the twenty uh, twenty one, uh, there was more diversity. Uh, I like having a little bit of diversity in terms of their subspecial, their specialty interest. One to PMR, one to radonc. <clears throat> well, this person at radonc, uh, she just emailed me la uh, this week. And she says she accepted a faculty position to stay on at Mayo and the, in the Radoff department. Okay. Um, so uh, one in Durham, two to anesthesia, one in uh, diagnostic radiology, one in ophthalmology, uh, one to, uh, to IR, and one to preventive medicine. So th there was a nice mixture of interest in that group. Now, starting in 2022, this is where the four of the positions um, are now dedicated to the University of Maryland Ophthalmology program. And then here, the rest, uh, we had uh, one to Durham, uh, two to uh, diagnostic uh, radiology, uh, one to IR, one to anesthesia. 2023, uh, we had uh, uh, three to diagnostic radiology, two to Durham, and one to PM&R. Uh, and uh, 2024, uh, we had two go to uh, IR, uh, Three go to diagnostic radiology, one to Durham. <clears throat> so uh, uh, we we don't uh, for, we don't select based on uh, where people are, what specialty they're interested in. Uh, that th that's fine. Uh, wherever they, uh, it's just a roll of the dice in terms of the non ophthalmology people. What the future um, uh, specialty is going to be. Now, uh, Dr. Haver, and uh, she she did a, she surveyed uh, the PMNR uh, residents from 2015 and 2019. And as you can see, um, a large number of them were radio future radiologists. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, her survey was um, uh, these are the results. Uh, Ninety-five percent of them would choose to do a TY internship again. Um, the 97% would advise future applicants in their specialty to consider a TY program rather than, a, for example, a, a prelim surgery program or prelim medicine program. And 86% reported that the TY internship helped affirm their decision to pursue their chosen specialty. Okay, now uh, just finishing up, word about Baltimore. Uh, the Inner Harbor, a very uh, festive area, uh, especially in the summertime, a lot, a lot of activities going on there. Um, Orioles are our baseball team. Uh, Orioles Stadium is right on the other side of the of the uh, medical school. Um, Orioles were in the playoffs this year. Uh, they're 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 a good team. Uh, it's a nice stadium. Uh, it's fun to go watch the the O's. Uh, the Baltimore Ravens uh, are our football team. Baltimore is a football town. They love the Ravens. The Raven Stadium on the other side of the Oriole Stadium. Uh, here's the Baltimore Museum of Art. It's about uh, four miles north of us. Uh, they have a wonderful collection. Uh, the crab is the food of Baltimore. They're not easy to eat. You need special instruments. Uh, we'll have, have a simulation lab for that. Um, we have a we have a soccer team, and the soccer team plays the other residencies in town. Now, there's we have to play uh, like Johns Hopkins. They have 160 residents. University of Maryland, they have 140 residents. We have to play those teams. And so I told our guys, hey, you have to practice, practice. Do they look like they're practicing here? I don't think so. Uh, a lot of, seems like a lot of uh, eating uh, happens outside the hospital. Uh, a lot of eating happens inside the hospital. Um, well, if you're not a Ravens fan, we'll get you converted to the Ravens. Um, now, this picture has a lot of residents in it, right? And that makes you wonder, well, who's working at the hospital? Scary thought. 
Right, so we, we did not win the soccer tournament, but we borrowed the trophy. We took a picture with the trophy. And you got to admit, we have the best shirts, Midtown United. Oh, uh, And this is last year. This was our shirt. It's a nice shirt. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I hope that you had a chance to... Um, uh, there's a fac faculty video uh, that you can look at. It's short. Uh, there's, there'll be new conference with the residents uh, to, that you can dial in on. There's a virtual tour uh, video that you can uh, have a look at. <clears throat> I think the most important is uh, is going to be the debriefing session with the residents. It's just with residents. There's no faculty, no one from the program there. <clears throat> and they've been told that nothing that the applicants say or do will come back to the program. So we want you to have a frank, open, candid discussion with the residents. Ask them any and all questions, and uh, and 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 cut open the underbelly of the program. Finally, I should mention that um, there isn't a need for uh, writing uh, follow-up uh, e emails uh, or notes uh, to the program. That's we don't. It's not um, re required or expected. On the other hand, if you have a question. Uh, or something didn't get answered, yeah, feel free to reach out to us. Glad to hear from you. Uh, uh, but there's, uh, there's there's no expectation that you should follow up with us uh, by mail. Um, so uh, so thank you uh, for hanging in there with this overview. Uh, if you survived it, uh, you should get a, 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 a medal. Uh, I apologize for so long. I look forward to meeting you during the uh, interview and talking to you about um, your uh, credentials, your accomplishments, and about how uh, this program might be a good fit for you. Uh, thanks, and look forward to speaking with you.